All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Mike Dunham Podcast. That's my first episode using that theme song. So uh, for those of you watching on YouTube and LinkedIn, you're in for a treat there. Uh, if you haven't checked out the previous episode, that was, of course, with uh, retired NYPD Chief of Department Terry Monahan. Uh, Terry discussed with me his 38 years in policing, including, of course, what goes into being the highest ranking uniformed officer in the largest police department in the nation. Uh, so he's an interesting guy to chat with. And if you haven't checked that out, uh, please go do so. We are live on YouTube. We are live on LinkedIn, as I said. And for 127 episode, uh, 127, that is, we bring in my, ne my next guest, excuse me, a long tenured vet veteran of journalism with over five decades of experience. Uh, he's just about seen it all with stints at as a contributor to CBS, ABC, CNN, and currently PBS and Political Magazine. He's a winner of five Emmy Awards and the author of 14 books and is currently a uh, correspondent for PBS's News Hour Weekend, and that is Jeff Greenfield, who joins us now on the Mike in New Haven podcast. Jeff, pleasure to have you. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. And I did not expect to hear big band music. Uh, what, <laughs> what is the theme? What's the song? What's the tune? I I created that in an app called iMovie. It's a retro feel. It gave me numerous options. That was the best of the bunch. And it's generic too, and it's royalty free because I do not want to get copyrighted. Understood. It's it was uh, a nice throwback feeling for a senior citizen. So I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, no problem. So I always like to start with the origins of my guest. You grew up in Manhattan. You were raised in Manhattan during a great time for New York City, specifically to be a sports fan as we'll dive into as we go. Take me through your formative years. Born and raised on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, my dad was a single practitioner lawyer. My mom was a housewife till she went back, got a master's degree to teach, so there'd be money to go to college. Went to the New York City public schools. I never knew schools had a name till I left. You know, it was PS this and whatever. Um, and I was a kid who uh, absolutely loved infatuated by baseball, which back then, we're talking about starting in the 50s, was really the only sport. Pro football was an afterthought. You could get into a giant game for $2 or the student card. Pro basketball was a, a stepchild to New York City college basketball. Um, but baseball, three baseball teams, and I think from 1947 to 1956, when the Giants and Dodgers left, Every World Series but one had at least one New York team, and more often than not, two New York teams. So it was just a golden age uh, of being a, a baseball fan. And for reasons I can't explain to you, Mike, as with many of my fellow political journalists, a, fa a fascination with baseball kind of went hand in hand with an early fascination with politics. I have no explanation for this, but it's true. You know, it, it's funny, you were you were a preteen coming of age when the Giants and the Dodgers left. And what I find interesting is whenever the Dodgers or the Giants come into play, either the Mets or the Yankees, more so the Mets, obviously, than being National League teams, I get the Dodgers travel well um, because they're such a great team. It's the same thing with the Steelers, a franchise with rich history. They have a loyal fan base that follows them around. Same thing is true with the Yankees. But there's a generation of fans in New York whose grandparents or great-grandparents were fans of the Giants and the Dodgers when they were in the city. And so, therefore, they have taken an allegiance to those teams as well. So I'll ask you, even though you grew up a Yankee fan, the feeling um, when those two teams went west, tell me about the sadness or maybe lack thereof in New York City. Well, you, uh, if you want an Oedipal tinge to this, my dad was a fanatical Dodgers fan. His parents owned a candy store very close to Ebbets Field. And many of the Dodgers, it was a much more kind of a working class feel if you were a baseball player, but then would come into Greenfield's candy store to buy candy. The, uh, my grandmother told me a story that when, when World War II broke out and Pee Wee Reese, the Dodgers shortstop, was, was pulled into the service, he went into the candy store and bought what he called his good luck candies, boxes of them to last him through World War II, and he made it. In fact, I was the one, 
1951, my dad was in an office that didn't have a radio. I broadcast to him over the phone Bobby Thompson's home run, which broke his heart. I mean, talk about Oedipal, talk about a son destroyed his father. Um, as a Yankee fan, it had less impact, but there was no question when the, and I think it was particularly the Dodgers, because Brooklyn, even though it was part of New York, what, a lot of people who lived in Brooklyn didn't think of themselves as New Yorkers as much as Brooklynites. When Schaefer Beer sponsored the Dodgers, and when people would go into a bar in Brooklyn, they wouldn't ask for Schaefer Beer. They would ask for Dodger Beer. Uh, and so their leaving uh, was an act of, of betrayal for, you know, God knows how many, uh, how many fans. It was always blamed on Walter O'Malley, the owner of the Dodgers. But I think history showed, there's a really good documentary about this, that it was more Robert Moses, the power broker who basically ran New York, who just didn't want to pop for a new stadium. Um, but yeah, I, I know, I've got friends who are Dodger fans who if you ask them, uh, when did you get over them leaving? They'll say, I'll tell you when I know. <laughs> You know, and, and it's funny because when, you know, and I was a baby for this, but obviously with YouTube being such a, such a treasure trove of uh, archival footage for anything, you can go down that rabbit hole. When the Yankees and the Mets met up in 2000 for that Subway series, you know, the thing that older fans were trying to tell the younger generation experiencing that for the first time was, no, no, you've got to understand this is rare now, but this used to be commonplace when we were growing up. This was like another, it didn't matter to us. It was another, it was just another year. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the risk of eating up your show, 47, 49, Yankees, Dodgers, 51, mm -hmm. Yankees, Giants, 52, 53, Yankees, Dodgers, 55, 56, Yankees, Dodgers. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, if you were a kid when the Yankees were running off those five championships in a row, you know, uh, 49 through 53, the next year, 54, the Yankees won, I think, close to 100 games, just the Cleveland Indians uh managed to beat them. Mm -hmm. And it was a shock. Wait, what, what do you mean? This, the Yankees are not in the World Series? This is the violation of some scientific <laughs> law. This can't happen. Yeah. yeah absolutely. 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 So for my for my younger audience out there, yes, believe it or not, there was a time when the Yankees used to actually win things. So uh, hopefully they can get back to that soon, as we'll be discussing later in the show. Jeff Ooh. Greenfield is our guest here at the Mike the New Haven podcast, like I said, live on YouTube and on LinkedIn. So if you're watching pleasure to have you happy that you're here back to your career you know you talked about journalism or excuse me a fandom of baseball going hand in hand with your career uh and the kind of journalism that you specialized in through the years when did you know you wanted to go into journalism always always okay. when i was one of the things about growing up in a, as a new york city public school kid is you go on these interesting tours uh and one of them was to the new york times they would take you through the plant you know through the, the, the city room, and then down into the, to the place where the paper gets printed. I just always knew I wanted to do something like that. I put out a student newspaper in the third or fourth grade on, uh, and this will date me more than almost anything, on Mimeo machines. Nobody knows what a mimeograph machine is, but your hands got stained purple by running off the things. Uh, I just always thought writing was the best thing you could do uh, and feed yourself. And I got in, in fact, Mike, the reason I got interested in politics was because of baseball. Now I'm thinking about this. 1952, I'm dating myself. This is how old I am. I'm, uh, it's the summer. I'm in my grandfather's cottage with my mother. My dad's working in the city. And I would listen to the Yankees every day on the radio. And one day my mother said, we can't listen to the Yankees. Why not? Well, there's a convention going on. What's a convention? Well, they're trying to pick who the, who the presidential candidate's going to be. As it happened, 1952 was a knockdown, drag out, old fashioned Pier 6 brawl at the Republican convention. I didn't know what I was listening to. I just knew it was fascinating. And quite literally, as a kid, really little kid, that's when my interest in politics began and it, it just kept going. I, I would, uh, in the days when there was no computer, you had to wait till Thursday after the election when the New York Times came out to get all the results of what happened. I would devour that part of the paper uh, until I, you know, my eyeballs fell out. Oh, look who won the 8th Congressional District in Maryland. This is a little odd, I know, for a kid, but it got me. Yeah, you, you had an interest. I mean, there are certain things that envelop uh, children as they're young. 
um, passions that they undertake at a very young age, a very tender age. And as long as those passions aren't self-destructive, yeah. have at it, you know? So that plays perfectly into your time at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, because think about it, it's the 1960s. You're the editor-in-chief of their paper, The Daily Cardinal. The 1960s kind of speaks for itself. Except this is, a, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I was there during the first part of the 1960s. And the division between the first part and what happened in the late 60s was night and day. There were protests at my campus. There were marches. Everything was peaceful. There was no tear gas as there was in 1967. There was no bombing of a building as there was in 1970. There were no National Guardsmen on the streets as there were in 1968. None of that happened until the Vietnam War exploded and escalated. And so, to, you know, to, the difference between when I left in 1964 and literally a year and a half later, war had escalated. It, it was like a completely different place. I went back there in 1970 to do some reporting. It was a different, completely different place. So yes, it was a time when people were interested in politics, but what a lot of my classmates and I would do was gather around the TV set in the student union and watch John Kennedy's press conferences because they were mostly during the day. He was an extremely witty, uh, articulate, confidential guy. And that was what politics was then. That was the Peace Corps recruiting people off campus. A much sunnier, less, less angry kind of politics than, than what developed just a couple of years later. When Kennedy was murdered in, in 1963, mm -hmm. um, we just hit the 58th year of mm -hmm. that. Um, you being the editor in chief of the Daily Cardinal, which was the University of Madison, Wisconsin's um, newspaper, mm -hmm. take me through how someone as young as you were at the time, 20 years old, 21 years old, covers something like that. I mean, I vividly remember this. I got a call from my girlfriend. I was in my back in my apartment. She said, I just turned on the radio that Kennedy's been shot. And he said, I said, you, that can't be right. I'm sure that, it, you know, because it was such a much less violent time. You know, we hadn't had a presidential assassination in 60 years. So I said, oh, well, and I turned on my radio just at, at uh, the, on the hour. And the announcer said, this is NBC News. President Kennedy has been shot. And so, you know, I ran back to the student paper and uh, sent people out to just get campus reactions. We obviously weren't in a position to report anything. Uh, and that's your first instinct as a journalist is what's the story. Uh, and as every, anybody who was around and a relative grown up back then, and by the way, there were only, I think only something like 75% uh, of the people around today were not alive when Kennedy was, was shot. But for those of us of a certain age, it is the, you know, along with September 11th, it's like an absolutely indelible memory. It's four days of nothing, the, everything shutting down. Uh, four days of images on those black and white TVs because nobody had color. If you really want to see what it looked like, you don't want to see color footage. You want to see the, the kinescopes and the videotapes of, of all that somber grayness. Uh, and a, a total sense of fear. It's happening here. He also contrasts that with the fact that Kennedy, whatever the reality was about his health, projected the notion of an extremely young and vigorous and agile guy. You know, he'd succeeded Dwight Eisenhower, then the oldest president ever. He was 43 when he was elected. The image was touch football and sailing and bigger. How could somebody like that be taken out and murdered in broad daylight in the streets of a major American city? That, that was that was the shockwave that in some sense, in different forms, keeps reverberating. I think on January 6th, a lot of people had the same reaction at the insurrection of the Capitol. How can this be happening here? But things like that have happened, and I would mark it with the start of his assassination, over and over. You say, how could this be happening here? I think you mentioned 9-11. It's the same thing with that. As you're watching those images, as we'll discuss later, exactly that reaction. How in the world is this happening here? Or even prior to that with the bombing in 1993 uh, that occurred at, at, at the Trade Center as well. My friend Bill Ryan's in the chat, and he was a detective with the arson explosion squad. He investigated that 
uh, bombing. Um, Bill, good to see you. And my sister's here too. So shout out to all those in the live chat watching on LinkedIn and YouTube. So you were at Yale Law School for a while uh, down yeah. in my neck of the woods in New Haven. I got to ask you, how, how what what you like about New Haven in the 60s? Pepe's. <laughs> good answer. Actually, uh, back then, right behind Pepe's was a pizza joint called The Spot. I think it has long since gone. A real shabby place with a pot-bellied stove and, you know, even more authentic pizza. Okay. In fact, when my wife used to come with me to reunions, the deal was we had to skip the alumni lunch and go and wait online on Pepe's, uh, you know, because it's pretty good. I know there's a big fight about what's better. Anyway, uh, I went to law school in the absolute conviction that I was not going to be a lawyer. My dad is, was a lawyer. My daughter's a lawyer. I never took the bar. I knew I wasn't, I sort of knew I wasn't going to do this. For five minutes, I thought I was going to be Clarence Starrow, the great defense attorney, you know, Leopold and Loeb and, and the Scopes monkey trial. But I knew. Uh, and therefore, law school was fun for me because the smartest people I ever met were the students and particularly the faculty uh, at the law school. And the, the kind of intellectual exercise you go through is unparalleled to me. Um, and it's also true that if you're interested in politics in America, uh, law and lawyers too much so dominate it. You know, how are you going to cover politics if you don't understand the Supreme Court um, or the various kinds of battles in the Congress? So I had a wonderful time uh, in, the, in the sense of being relaxed. Um, it's funny, law, Yale has always had a reputation of being a very left wing law school. And three of the justices of the Supreme Court who come out of Yale Law School are Alito, uh, Kavanaugh, and Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Sotomayor you are also. But, but, you know, it's all I can say is that um, I'm, I'm really glad I went. The discipline it teaches you how to think about thinking is useful. The one problem with going to law school, Mike, is you have to learn to write again in English <laughs> because... You know, it's a, it's drenched in Latinate passive clauses. And I remember when I wrote my note for the law review, the law journal, my mother, who liked everything I ever wrote, said, this doesn't sound like you. And I said, that's right, because I had to write like a lawyer. I will say, though, you know, having that degree, even if you didn't go into the I had this conversation with Ashley Banfield when she was on because she didn't become a lawyer. She's obviously in your field as well. But the background in law has helped. For, for her to cover certain stories in a way that maybe other journalists can't because they don't have that same advantage. How do you feel it's helped you? I can give you a very concrete example. Uh, the, the 2000 election, mm -hmm. uh, I'm waiting to go on at 10 o'clock to anchor or sub-anchor of CNN, and the Supreme Court decision drops literally 30 seconds before air. And somebody gr throws me the paper, and I... Uh, you know, I got to say something, right? You don't want to sound like Ralph Cramden on the Honeymooners if you've ever seen it going hamana, hamana, hamana. So I said, wait a minute. The way I'm going to find out what happened is to turn to the dissents because they're going to explain clearly who lost and then I'll know who won. And because I, you know, I'd read a lot of Supreme Court cases, I went right to the dissents. I saw who was the and I said, that's it. It's over. You know, it's, they're giving it to Bush and they're not going to, there's no, there's no running room here. Um, but beyond that, look, even in, in the field that uh, you have some interest in, in sports these days, uh, having a law degree kind of helps. I mean, uh, God help us. We may be going into a situation where we're going to have to see all the arguments for and against a lockout. Uh, you know, when players fire grievances, when, when players are suspended, what are the grounds for the suspension? Um, if, they, if somebody wants to break a contract, you know, study that in the first year in law school. So I'm not sure that's, sure that's a healthy part of covering sports, but it, there are a whole bunch of areas where it helps. And I will say this, Mike, if you have a law degree and you're covering politics, the politicians <clears throat> are a little less likely to try to bamboozle you. Because they think, well, I, get, I, can't, I can't go to level one of the evasions because he, he may know something about the law. So I'll have to try level two. So I'm, it's it's been a help, you know. I, I, I as I say, I'm really happy I went. Yeah, it's it's a good uh, it's a good asset to have in your back pocket, you know, because you never like with many things in life, you never know when you're going to need it. 
it's kind of what they used to tell us in school when there were subjects that I would study that I would just be like, what is the point of this? There have been times in my adult life where now you see it. Other things, not so much, but certain things, like in your case, of course, it pops into mind because it is, uh, if, if not an everyday part of life, and certainly can take up a significant chunk of it given certain right. events. Right. I've had very little use of trigonometry, I have to say, in my life. I'm still working Same. on that one. Uh, I have <laughs> yeah. a dear friend, the, the late movie critic, Gerald Siegel, said, you know, just yesterday I was passing by a school and I wondered how long is the shadow that that flagpole is casting? And I realized, thanks to trigonometry, I could figure that out. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, perhaps not so much. But yeah, you're right. There are times when uh, you have no idea why you're figuring some, why you're le learning something. Although in law school, you know why you're in law school. You're trying to learn about the law. Um, and particularly now, I mean, it's really uh, gone a little bit round the bend up, up at Yale Law School with the arguments about critical ra race theory. Before there was critical race theory years ago, Law schools began developing critical legal studies, mm -hmm. which is based on a similar idea that beneath the neutrality of the law, there, there are power structures who are using the law to gain supremacy and fight back against others looking for, looking for power. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a pretty rich field. And as I say, if you had the right kind of teachers, it was... It was really fascinating. It was actually fun to try to think through when some of these guys would, in, at least when I was in law school, one of the ways you, you were treated was like a nonviolent drill instructor. These professors would, would intellectually push you against the wall. Why are you arguing that? Where's your evidence for that? Because they were trying to train you to think under pressure. I have a feeling now if you tried to teach that way, you'd be sued. You're probably right. That's yeah. the unfortunate part of it. Jeff Greenfield's our guest here on the Mike in New Haven podcast. A quick shout out to the live chat. Again, Angela Ang, retired NYPD officer, host or co-host, I should say, of the Allegedly Guilty podcast is here. And I do want to say for all the listeners, if you have a question for either myself or Jeff, type it up in the chat and I'll be sure to uh, check it out and make sure that Jeff uh, sees it. So I want to pivot back for a second because around this time, I imagine writing in law school would help you much like the law degree itself helped you because you were a speech writer to the late Robert F. Kennedy, um, and you crafted the speech, uh, The Mindless Menace of Violence, which is regarded as one of his better speeches. Being around him here as somebody that's from the Kennedy family, obviously the Kennedy family, even now with all the unfortunate and tragic losses they've suffered, remain a very popular name in American lore. And here is somebody that had his eyes on his brother's seat and uh, was gunning for that in 1968 when tragically, courtesy of Sirhan Sirhan, his life as also much like his brother was violently cut short uh, courtesy of the barrel of a gun. Working with him and specifically crafting that speech, what was he like? And, and when you look back on that speech, um, how, what does the message still hold up 50 plus years later? Let me put that speech aside for a minute because I've been with him for several months in his Senate office mm -hmm. as a very, as, look, as a junior speech writer, it was an accident of short staffing. Nobody hires, well, actually Obama did, but you don't usually hire a 24-year-old and say, you're going to be my speechwriter. He had a brilliant speechwriter, but there's so much work for a senator and so little staff that because I had allegedly a facility to write, I would occasionally be brought in to do that. And when you worked with Bobby Kennedy, the most challenging part of it was he could spot the weakness in what you were writing. He was not formally an intellectual in the academic sense. But he had a mind that could drill down beyond the kind of cliches. He said, where are you getting that from? You know, uh, and have you thought about this? He was a very unconventional thinker. Even back in the, this was in 1967, he was challenging a lot of liberal orthodoxies, but also in some ways was more radical than the liberals about things like race and poverty. The speech you're talking about was uh, given the day after Martin Luther King was killed. Now, the, the, the most memorable speech he gave was that night in Indianapolis, where he spontaneously told a crowd of, in a, a black neighborhood, several thousand, that King had, in fact, been killed and urged them not to, not to express their anger and hate. He quoted lines from the poet Aeschylus. He asked them to go home and say a prayer. It was one of the few communities that did not experience an upheaval of violence. But the next day, it was a speech that... Uh, 
I worked on along with his chief speechwriter, Adam Walensky and Ted Sorensen, who had been John Kennedy's speechwriter, really about, about, about violence. And it, it was interesting to me because after the speech, William Buckley, a conservative, said, well, is, is it really true that violence has never accomplished anything? Because the tragic thing is, violence in the most horrible way imaginable has accomplished stuff. You know, what would it have been like in the Middle East if Yitzhak Rabin had not been assassinated? What would, would we have stayed in Vietnam if Jack Kennedy had been alive? I don't think so. Might we have ended the Vietnam War five years earlier if Bobby had managed somehow to get elected president? And would, would conditions among the less well off of us be very different in a Robert Kennedy presidency? So obviously nobody uh, is advocating violence. And the point of the speech was it was, it was a, a corrosive, horrible evil, as we have seen now, that is now it's worked its way into some of the more uh, significant parts of our political process. There are people out there in Congress saying, you know, showing, making videos, showing them killing a member of the other party. There was a rally not so long ago where one of the people complaining about the stolen election was saying, when do we get to use the guns? So in that sense, you know, the, 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 the menace of violence, we don't have streets riots the way we did in the 1960s. We don't have dozens of people being killed in Newark, in Detroit, and Watts. But the, the acceptance of violence or the flirtation with violence uh, is very much with us. And that's a scary thought because, I mean, think about it in the seven, as I frequently profiled when I speak with my members of the retired friends from the NYPD bomb squad, the 70s and the 80s, they were very busy because as part of the domestic terrorism uprising, you talked earlier about the upheaval of violence, part of the, the message was bombs, bombs at uh, 26 Federal Plaza, bombs at one police plaza, bombings of hotels, bombs at airports. Um, it's uh, it, it's a, a, a descent into chaos that... Um, if you have any kind of reasoning, any kind of rationale, uh, should frighten you. And, and so 1968, that same year, you mentioned William Buckley, who was one of the hosts, I believe the host actually, of Firing Line. And yeah. Firing Line was unique in that it's a lost art because if somebody disagrees with somebody about anything, for example, being sports fan, I think this player is better than this player. You know, yeah. we don't, we have this tendency now, which is why I can't stand watching ESPN anymore you know, um, of you have to tear the other person down. If that person has a separate opinion on something as trivial as that, they're right. an idiot, they, they're, they're, they're hopeless. Whereas with Firing Line, it was civil. So working with Buckley, who was a product of a bygone era, take me through not only what he was like to be around as well, but what he taught you either directly or just by his conduct and, and pleasantness indirectly. You know, you, you have hit several nails on the head here, if that's possible. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I got... Uh, to know, I didn't know Buckley. My, con my connection with him was that he came up to New Haven, to Yale, to debate the left-wing chaplain, uh, William Sloan Coffin. Uh, and I did a piece about this for the alumni magazine. It was a kind of a snarky, satirical piece. But one of the things about Buckley was he loved adversaries. And he was sort of taken with that piece. And uh, uh, a couple of years later, when Fiery Line decided to bring on young people, you can see how long ago that was, to, to offer contrary views, he asked if I'd be one of them. Uh, and part of the great, well, there were two great things about it. One, if you start your adult life arguing with Bill Buckley, you know, the rest of it is kind of like not that challenging. You know, I mean, if you're a 20 year old, 24 year old boxer and their first opponent is, I don't know, Joe Fraser, the rest of what you face is probably not going to be that frightening. But more to the point, he loved the challenge. He, if you made a point to him or his guest that he, an adversarial point that he thought had some merit, you could almost see the glint in his eye going, oh, that's interesting. He wouldn't say, you know, you're a moron, snowflake, whatever. Uh, he would engage. And, and it, it, many of the people that he had on the show or that were friends, people like the liberal economist John Kenneth Galbraith, the anti-war uh, organizer Al Lowenstein. Uh, his first guest, I think, on Firing Line was Norman Thomas, who was a longtime Socialist Party candidate for president. And he, he liked that kind of engagement. Uh, now, you know, I can point to things about Buckley's career that he had to answer to. His magazine, National Review, 
uh, was very much not on the side of civil rights people. He at one point wrote that whites should govern in the South because they were for the moment the advanced race. He later came to regret that. So there are, there are marks here. But unlike what you see now, where nothing is too radical, let's say, for the Republicans to say, you really shouldn't be in Congress with that attitude. In fact, we're going to embrace you. William Buckley, who was the editor of the National Review, an influential, the most influential conservative publication, essentially read a right, right, right wing group, the John Birch Society, out of the conservative movement. They were conspiratorialists. They thought communists were everywhere. He said, no, that's not who we are. Uh, today, you know, if you're for our, if you wear our team's uniform, you're, we don't care what you do. You're fine. There's almost no limit uh, that says, no, you know, I'm sorry. No, we don't want you here. Oh, you're for us? You're going to vote for us? Great. Come on in. And the, there is, doesn't seem to be any language, uh, any rancor that crosses a line. And I think that I, I like the uh, analogy you made with ESPN. I'm, I'm not a, I understand, I don't want to, that there are certain personalities on ESPN who uh, are quite loud, uh, quite vocal. Uh, and earn quite quite a bit of money for this, uh, and I think you know. <laughs> I think there's a. Uh, I, I think there's a. You know what Gresham's law is in economics: bad money drives out good. Yeah. Never mind. Well, bad rhetoric drives out good rhetoric. This is this is where the audience goes. This is what Facebook knows, among other people. You know that the more incendiary, the language, the more the more uh, looks there are and likes and, and follows. Um, I remember years ago, some writer said about me that I, one of the most thoughtful correspondents on TV, and I said, that's a career killer. I'm dead. Thoughtful? Oh, boy. Uh, I think you diagnosed a very accurate, you know, problem. I want to get to your time with CBS in 79, but before that, you worked with Mayor John Lindsay as a yep. speechwriter as well for him. And now I liken his seven years objectively, of course, speaking objectively, to the last seven years of the current his honor in, in New York and that it was very turbulent. Some things within his control, some things not, for example, the pandemic. But with Lindsay, poverty in New York City, rising crime. There are some things he could do about that, some things he just couldn't. It's just the way of the world working at the current time. And whoever's in charge is going to bear the blame or the praise, depending on how things were going. Uh, his legacy, almost 50 years later, being with him day to day and the stressors that he faced, writing his speeches. When you have somebody that after a while is so unpopular with constituents, does writing speeches become more difficult? Yeah, because you have to, you, you have to uh, begin by acknowledging what people are angry about, which is the thing that not every politician knows. I worked for a political consultant who I realized his theory was if there's an elephant in the room, tell the people you see the elephant in the room. But, in, but you're talking about, it's, it's funny, I'm gonna show you how this links, as you probably will figure out, with baseball. Mm. Uh, in 1968, after uh, Kennedy was killed, I was, Lindsay walked the streets of Harlem in bed -Stuy, one of the only mayors in America who could do that and keep the city calm. That was the principal goal. In the next year, we had a horrible teacher strike that shut the schools down for weeks and weeks. We had uh, a, a police strike for a while. We had a sanitation strike. Uh, and we had the continuing split between a traditional uh, coalition of blacks and white working class. Now, Lindsay was a Republican, a liberal Republican. You, only have, you have to go to a museum to see one these days. And, <laughs> and, and what happened was that Lindsay came in as a very unusual kind of mayor. He wasn't part of the normal city political mix of tribal democratic politics. Uh, and the white working class particularly saw Lindsay as giving away, that the cliche was he was giving away the city to the blacks. And so there was a tremendous division there. Um, he won a second term partly because he was running against two conservatives, partly because we, we the Lindsay team, managed to make the Vietnam War uh, an issue because both of the other candidates were for it. And as you know, 1969 was the year that the Mets became the Mets. And it is not a secret that we in the Lindsay campaign 
basically tied John Lindsay to the New York Mets with a chain. He was in the clubhouse the night they won the pennant, and the picture of him getting champagne poured over his head, which I believe was on the front page of the New York Times, was probably worth 100,000 votes. There's a little secret I'll tell you. John Lindsay was not a baseball fan. And his staff basically had to say, you are going to the game and you are not leaving. I don't care if the game goes, you know, 20 innings. You're staying here. Uh, so he did get a second term, but Lindsay years really were a, a kind of a, a microcosm of what happened to broader politics in, in urban America. Uh, and I think you're quite right. Crime, poverty, race, all of those toxic elements played a role. Um, and by now, there are no, you know, John Lindsay, Nelson Rockefeller, Jacob Javits. Uh, I'm mentioning names that may be unknown to your audience, but these oh, were. No, they're, they're known. Don't worry okay. about it. Prominent New York Republicans and then all over America, literally from coast to coast. People don't realize this about what happened with the Great Society. Plenty of Republicans voted for Lyndon Johnson's Medicare and education bills. Today, go find a conservative Democrat or a liberal Republican. Good luck. Um, but it was difficult. It was really difficult for Lindsay because, as I say, he came, he came from the Upper East Side of Manhattan, the so-called silk stocking congressional district, because lots of rich people lived there. And he was a, a wasp in a city where the way you ran for the city in those days, you, with your ticket, you had an Irishman, an Italian man, and a Jew. Uh, at that point, blacks were essentially shut out of citywide uh, posts. And here was this guy, you know, this white Anglo-Saxon, tall, handsome, tennis playing Republican. And culturally, he was a very tough fit for New Yorkers. That brings us to 79. And like I said, and, and really, I think your time at, at ABC and by extension, uh, well, excuse me, CBS, I should say, and then later ABC from 83 to 97, goes together because all of those historical events occurred in, in such a rapid succession of time. But CBS, you're in the eye of the storm. You get there. Of course, there's the uh, Iran hostage crisis, which is going on that uh, segues from the Carter administration into the Reagan administration. Reagan himself is nearly gunned down uh, by John Hinckley in 1981. We have the conflict in Beirut in which there's a bombing. Numerous Marines are killed. The fall of the Berlin Wall, you would be at uh, ABC for that later on in 89. But for the 80s, which is a, a really, it's not the 60s. It gets overshadowed by the latter half of the 60s. But the 80s contained a lot of events that are still defining our time now. When you look back at that period, starting from the hostage crisis, going through Reagan nearly getting killed, ending with the Berlin Wall coming down, it had to have been hard to keep up. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what era is not hard to keep up. I, I'm not sure what the sleepiest era you'd find. Uh, it's not so. I, I'm I'm trying to think if that's the way to look at it because if you think about it, the era if, if 1980 is the starting point uh, with hostages, with a, a radical shift in who was governing us. You know, Ronald Reagan as a conservative had been for Barry Goldwater 16 years earlier when Goldwater got absolutely demolished, and now Reagan wins a landslide. But the arc of that of that um, decade ends. With the with essentially with the with the end of the Soviet Union, symbolized by the fall of the Berlin Wall, and a feeling at least by the end is uh, people actually as well, there are no more big issues anymore. It's going to be a much less tumultuous time. There's no Cold War. There's no threat of thermonuclear uh, annihilation. You know, in 1983, ABC aired a movie called The Day After about a nuclear war. And it was one of the most watched, people forget this, it was one of the most wo most watched shows in television history. And it scared the living stuff out of billions of Americans. Well, by the end of, you know, 1989, hey, no more Soviet Union. We can relax. The idea of a resurgent terrorism, stateless terrorism, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, you know, you wouldn't even have imagined that, but you're quite right that, you know, I, I'm off, I often, I've written several books of alternate history of what ifs. And one of the ones that I uh, didn't do was if John Hinckley had aimed his gun two inches to his left, Reagan would have bled to death. That's how close he came to dying. Eight weeks or so into his term, instead of eight years, he would have had eight weeks. 
And there are so many things in, in, a, in a, our history that come down to the tiniest, you know, flip of a coin. Game of inches, if you will. Well, quite little. Look, if, if, it, if the, we've just, as you mentioned, we've just passed the 58th anniversary of John Kennedy's death. If the rain had not stopped in Dallas, the bubble top would have stayed on top of the car. Mm -hmm. And there may not, well, have, you know, that might have made the difference. Just an accident mm -hmm. of the weather. Yeah. Uh, but in, in terms of, of the, of, as I say, I don't want to overstate this because, you know, that's a long decade. There were plenty of times in the 80s when you said, oh, well, there's really not much news. Uh, and then there are these periods where it's like a hammerhead. Just one thing after another keeps happening. Uh, and and shocked you. I know the uh, ter terrorism in the Middle East, hijackings, um, very much so, were were up and about. But my beat was almost exclusively domestic politics and culture. Um, the one time that I actually faced anything approaching real danger was when I was at Nightlight. We went to South Africa for a couple of weeks. Uh, we, we were the fr and in fact, it changed South Africa because they broadcast some of the shows on a, a very censored television network. It was the first time South Africans had seen a white man debate a black man on equal terms. But I was in Soweto, the large black township, and uh, a bunch of students there thought we were from South African broadcasting and began to come to us with um, unfriendly intentions. And fortunately, we had a, we had a popular figure in, in the township who said, no, no, they're okay. Um, but look, the first time I went to South Africa, I came back and, and, and said, this will never change. You know, impossible. I went back four years later and listened to Nelson Mandela give his one of his first speeches as a free man in the soccer stadium in Soweto, which is a good lesson to all future prognosticators. Do not be so quick to predict. Do not be so quick to say what is going on now is inevitably what's going to happen in the future. Uh, you know, you can make some very, you can make some assumptions look pretty silly. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but there's a clip going around now of all these famous people from 2015 saying, it's impossible that Trump can be president. Ridiculous. Don't even think about it. And I, I also would be remiss not to mention about the 80s, Lenin's assassination as well. That's a factor in given the fact that he was a cultural icon. And you mentioned, of course, the advent of terrorism. You know, we have Anwar Sadat's assassination. Sadat was a, a polarizing figure in Egypt, and Croatia was active. And so it was, like I said, a, a, there are certain sports, as you said, I should say, there was a hammerhead period. Um, you know, working at CBS, and then I'll get to ABC in a second. Well, I guess I can mix it together. And Jeff Greenfield's our guest here in the Mike the New Haven podcast, because think about it. CBS, Cronkite. You get to ABC, and there is Peter Jennings. And these are figures that, in one way or another, have definitively defined, if I could <laughs> mess those two words together, definitively defined, uh, right. not just the, the way news is in America, but the proper way, if there is one, to present. Um, John Miller, who's the current NYPD Deputy Commissioner yeah. of uh, Intelligence, was a is a friend of mine. He's been on this show. He talked of Peter Jennings' grace and his wit and how prepared he was. When you look back on him and when you look back on Cronkite, what are some great memories that you personally had with each man that you can tell me? Well, I should say that Cronkite, Jennings, Brokaw uh, represent what was the neutral Olympian anchor who you turn to in times of crisis because they are voices that reassure. They are voices of authority. We don't have that anymore. It's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not avoiding you, but I want to make this point. The evening news, which was at one point the most important part of any network newscast, is far less significant than the morning news in terms of how many people watch it and particularly in terms of how much it earns. But in those days, they were, and particularly when news broke, uh, the, the, um, you may have seen it yesterday of Cronkite announcing the shooting and the death of John Kennedy and him taking off his glasses and just pausing for one minute. And you'd never seen that before. You know, he was so much the rock, the imperturbable anchor, that that was almost impossible to imagine. Um, Peter Jennings, complicated man, but a hero. He is probably responsible for saving countless lives uh, during the Balkans conflict by keeping his cameras 
in places like Srebrenica and showing what was going on in Sarajevo and insisting that the world pay attention to what was going on. Um, you know, that was uh, and at, at substantial personal risk. I mean, one of his producers was killed by a sniper. Um, so these, these people represent a time when, when there were three sources of news. There was no cable. Lord knows there was no social media. And they had a, a, they had a, uh, an authority that no one will, will ever have again. Uh, Cronkite used to end his broadcast, something that he sort of regretted by saying, and that's the way it is. Tuesday, November 23rd. And then he realized, well, it's the way it is for 22 minutes. You know, uh, and he used to say he wished he could end the show saying, for more detailed news, consult your local newspaper, which, of course, is now an endangered species in and of itself. Right. So the, the whole world where, where, you don't, where you had so few sources of information uh, did give the networks a kind of an air of authority. That they will, they will, they will not have again. Uh, I'm, I got a, I can't say I got a kick, but I, you know, CNN years ago started defining everything as breaking news because you, you have to be excited. Breaking news: election to be held November third. Breaking news: Christmas coming in six weeks. Now all the networks, the broadcast networks, begin all their shows that way. Breaking news: breaking news: breaking news. Which you know, that's what that's nice. nice. It drives me nuts because, yeah, I'll, I'll, it, there's another version of that special report. When you think of special report, you kind of pause and you say, uh oh, you get chills down your spine because right. think about how some of the major stories have been broken. For example, you mentioned Kennedy, you mentioned September 11th, special report starts off and you're, you're uh, looking at this uh, uh, major event unfolding, whatever it may be. Now it's just exactly relatively innocuous stories. This person's going to testify. It's not exactly groundbreaking stuff, but then again, for the purpose of engagement, I, I, I feel like most now, and this goes for sports media, any kind of media, they're running around with their chickens, uh, like, like chickens with their heads cut off, because they don't know how in the era of the internet and phones, where I can just take this and figure out what's going on, right. like that, and snap of a finger, how to keep me engaged. I thought that the beginning of this was the invention of the, of the uh, remote control, because when I was young, you had to get up and walk to the TV to change a channel. And so you weren't necessarily likely to flip. And they may have had some time to engage you. Now the panic is, you know, if I don't tell people, breaking news, you can't wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn on, I don't know, Shark Tank or whatever I'll turn on. Mm -hmm. uh, th look, I like the fact that there are 7,000 things to, to, to watch. You know, I'm as addicted to screening as anybody, streaming as anybody else. Yeah. But there, there's a certain advantage to having a different flow to this. Uh, and there's, you know, I'll tell you this. Uh, I'll tell a little tale out of school. Um, when a friend of mine became president of CBS News, I, I wrote to her. I said, why don't you just blow the whole, the whole format up? It's so old, outdated. 22 minutes into, you know, two minutes for a piece. Maybe you'll have four minutes for a piece. Why don't we do a different, why don't you try a completely different kind of newscast? Because it's interesting to me that the two biggest shows on CBS News by far are 60 Minutes and Sunday Morning. Mm -hmm. 9 a.m. on Sunday Morning gets a bigger rating often than the evening newscast. Because I watch it religiously. That was the first my first ex, uh, ex, experience on CBS. You know, take you want seven minutes for a piece, you want ten minutes for a piece, slow it down because it's Sunday and people have the time. I'm not suggesting you could do that in the week. But there are, there are, you might conceivably want to try engaging the audience by taking your time to explain something to them. But it's easy to say that as a, uh, pardon the sports analogy, an armchair quarterback. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys' jobs are, and ladies, are their jobs are on the line, men and women, to figure out how to keep an audience. I want to go back to a comment. Angela Ang, a friend of mine, like I said, retired NYPD officer and the co-host of the Allegedly Guilty podcast. Uh, she said that was the only source of news then, unlike now, when there's a lot of information on hand. And sometimes, as you well know, slants to that information where I know which way this person leans, and they're letting that bleed into the coverage, which is not healthy either. Yeah. Quick and, aside. Uh, Angela, ahead. Angela's point is quite valid. One of the reasons why the old newscast <laughs> got so much 
audience was there's nothing else to watch. <laughs> New York had six channels. When I was a kid, six. So if you didn't watch the news, you watched old westerns or roller derby, or something like that. Uh, there was no competition. I said we would get into sports as we would go, and we kind of touched on it in the beginning, but we'll get into it now because mid '90s, you know, when Costas was on, he he joked with me. He's like, when when Marquise Grissom caught that fly ball out in left field, Braves Indians '95, he said the team of the '90s has his championship. And then the last portion of the 90s belonged to our Yankees. And he says, you know, if I can go back in time, I'd get that call right back because it wasn't that it was a bad call. It's who would have thought they would have went on a run like that. Um, and so 96 through 2000, well, really 2001. I don't really throw 2003 in there because a lot of the guys from the 90s weren't really there by that point. Um, a great run, uh, a dynastic run, one that you really haven't seen since. And along the way, in 1999, whilst you were with CNN, which you had joined in 1998 after a 14 year stint at ABC, and I do want to ask one more question on ABC in a second, you interviewed Bob Shepard. Yeah. Bob had been doing that job for over 50 years. We lost him in 2010, but he had led a wonderful long life, 99 years old. And here's a voice that when you think of the old Yankee Stadium, when you think of baseball, he's one of the instant memories that you have sitting with him in a ballpark as prestigious as that one watching him at work take me through what he was like uh, extremely he was a gentleman what you heard in his voice is who he was stately uh careful in his language i don't mean cautious but you know he would never offend he was at that point in his at least in his mid 90s maybe later he would never he would never tell his age but when you saw when he played college baseball and did the math he was well into his 90s um and you know i think reggie jackson among others called him the voice of god i think every kid who ever went to yankee stadium or my son among them will give you a bob shepherd impression you know absolutely, absolutely. and didn't cheater insist till the end of it that even to when the new that. announcer came that yeah mm -hmm. um the voice of god uh it was a good kick for me you know i mean one of the reasons i still do occasional sports is you know i'm still a kid uh my son and i went to games four and five of the 2001 world series when you know two out in the ninth yankees trailing by two runs and two successive game tying home runs now we were also in 2003 when uh uh we lost two nothing to the uh Marlins. Florida Marlins yeah Josh we, Beckett Beckett we were there in same six and seven of oh four of the ALCS mm. <sighs> um <laughs> but you know that's what I still love about uh about baseball and you know yeah okay I'm a Yankee fan I'm not a neutral it's a little frustrating they keep not getting there I know there's a theory that more than one person has that the Yankees are perfectly content as long as they're competitive enough to put backsides in the seats, they're fine. I tend to believe that, to be honest with you. And that's, and, and you know, am I as passionate now as I once was? It, no, because it's interesting. Somebody told me this years ago. They told me, as you get older and you have more responsibilities, you're going to see your fandom wane. And I was 11 years old at the time. Like, what are you talking about? Because at that age, when you don't have that many responsibilities, you live and you die by it. But now, 21, almost 22, as I see my responsibilities increase, I still follow it. I am still that little kid inside, but the passion for it has waned and not so much of the pace of play. I, I hate the pace of I pace of play argument. I, I, I hate the shifts. I hate the whole analytical deep dive into where a guy can't go the third time through the order. It's nonsense. Uh, and you can call me old fashioned that way. But when I look at the way the game is now, I think the, the thing that's missing is the personalities. There is no marketability and no personality. To rather not you liked Roger Clemens. And I get Roger Clemens, talent aside, was a difficult person to be on the, on the uh, favorable side of. But nonetheless, personality, Barry Bonds, the same way. you know. And there were other individuals like that that in addition to having personalities also had a wealth of talent. I have nothing against Mike Trout. Mike Trout is by all accounts a good man. Uh, first things first, and a great baseball player who was on the fast track to the Hall of Fame. But you sometimes you even forget what the guy sounds like. You never hear from him. Well, it's interesting. Uh, the There was a guy back whose personality was as dominant as his ability, and that's a guy named Babe Ruth. 
Yes. Made movies, did barnstorming tours, had a real larger than life personality. And not quite like Muhammad Ali, but there's a vague, you know, you knew who he was apart from what he did. Um, by the way, I did at least two pieces, one for ABC and one for CNN, on the pace of the game 20 years ago, mm -hmm. saying it's called America's pastime, not past time. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I have the same. I once did a piece of Sports Illustrated where I said, get me a game from the 80s. I want to watch every pitch. I want to time the whole game. And it was an 83 game, five to three, a couple of relief pitches. The game took like two hours and 13 minutes. And the, re the reason was no pitcher took close to 20 seconds when there was nobody on base. And the batters never stepped out of the box. This whole OCD thing, you know, where every pitch you got to, you know, do all that. And the pitcher goes into transcendental meditation. And then, the, you know, then there's, then there's a conference on the mound that's longer than the Paris Peace Talks. Yeah, like I love baseball. And I, I got nothing against – I thought a lot of the playoff games, so I thought the World Series was a bust because it just wasn't that interesting. But yeah. some of those league championship games were really – that's, you know, I don't care if they go on for four and a half hours if they're, you know, if they're these battles where one team takes the lead and the other. That's fine. I still remember the 86 uh, NLCS, if that's what it was called, the Mets-Astros 60-inning game. Mm -hmm. that game could have gone on, you know, forever, and I would have been enthralled. It's the four-hour two-to-one games uh, that, you know, where you say this, this, is, this, is, this is killing the sport. I mean, there are some instances where that is entertaining. Take, for example, the ALCS in Game 7. Uh, game 7 of the ALCS, I should say, 2003, the Aaron Boone game. You know, and by then the game had changed right. to where no more regards to your power is doing exactly what you said. He's stepping out of the box. He's doing that whole thing with his batting glove and we're getting different pitchers. But there's great drama to it to where sure. those little things mattered October, the, the 12 pitch at bat. But nonetheless, I think I, and I far be it for me to turn this into a, a therapy session in relation to the game. We, <laughs> there's other things I promised in the audience that we'll cover about Jeff's career as we go. And but, by the way, Mike, I have to break the fourth wall here. Mm -hmm. There's a particular reason. Uh how much tell me how how long you want to go i got no problem with the time but i'll tell you what i do i may have to do how how long do you want to go with this i don't plan to keep you beyond beyond an hour and a half i'll hit on a few All more right. things i'm looking at my battery and I, I i may have to get my charger if i excuse myself in a few minutes talk among yourselves i'll give you a topic i gotta run and sure. get the battery but for now we're okay Absolutely. That's fine. Uh, in the fourth wall, I break it all the time. So don't worry right. about it. Okay. But um, that being said, I mean, you know, I look at the game now and this whole analytical, you know, people tell me, as an example, Joey Gallo is a good baseball player. And I'm sure his defense is fine and defense is good. And I'm sure his advanced numbers line up with whatever metric we have now. But I hate watching him because his at-bats are atrocious. He goes 0 for 4 almost every other game, and okay, so what if you hit a ball 450 feet on occasion? When you do hit them, yes, to, to your credit, they go very far. Dave Kingman did that. Yes, Big, did. Whoop. Big whoop. Big uh, whoop. I got to, I'm going to, when we're done, I'm going to give you the name of a guest, a very well-known magazine editor who is a fanatical Yankee fan mm -hmm. and really knows his stuff and will take you position by position. I think he thinks, uh, well, I won't put words in his mouth, but he's not enamored of the Yankee leadership uh, in the front office. Let's put it that way. And Neither he is not, am I. Not, not a particularly fan of the current catcher. Neither am I. Uh, so, but so, back, to, back to your career now. ABC, Nightline, Ted Koppel. Right. Another, another stately individual, somebody who, you know, again, was very, I don't mean this in a bad way, it's a compliment, nondescript in his presentation, very straightforward, very mellow, and let his correspondents tell you the story, which is what I really loved. He didn't outshine them in any way. He didn't upstage them in any way. He was the ultimate floor general in that way, to use another analogy this time in relation to basketball. Working with Koppel, yeah. um, behind the scenes, seeing him and what he did day to day. How much did you enjoy that? And how? And, and is there a great story that you can tell me about? Well, uh, when Aaron Sorkin was doing his uh, HBO show Newsnight, mm -hmm. uh, I was a consultant, and the first question he asked me was, "Describe your journalistic utopia," and I said, "I lived it," because <laughs> and you you were exactly right in pointing to what happened, not just in front of the camera, but behind it. Every morning around eleven o'clock, there was a editorial meeting. And I wished at one point that they could tape those meetings and play them in every journalism school because that's the way journalism can be done. Now, to, to, to be fair, we only had one story to cover. 
But the questions were, who should we be talking to? You know, is there a part of this story that everybody else is missing? Are we being unfair? One of the things that endeared me to Koppel before I ever joined the show is he did a show on herpes on a Friday night. And Monday he came back. He said, last Friday we tried to do a show on herpes. He said, we, we did a terrible job. We're going to try it again tonight. That's, you not many journalists are going to do that. And no. also Koppel knew that sometimes the best question you could ask was not a four-minute introduction, which, by the way, is, I will mention no names, but there are there's at least one anchor on a network who, t t who, when he asks a question, basically takes up half the show. Sometimes Koppel's best question after he had heard an answer was, why? <laughs> you know? There you go. Sometimes less is more. Yeah, indeed. Which is what I'm, I'm trying to master that with this show. Sometimes I, I don't want to overthink the questions. Granted, I try to ask good ones. I try to keep my guests talking. Right. We've been talking for an hour and change now, so I, I think I've done a good job of it here. Um, but, you know, I definitely um, sometimes like to keep it simple and that I, I, it gives them a better chance to run. And there's a, it's an interesting metric to go by because there's sometimes a pause in the conversation with the thought and the wheels are turning in that individual's head to where I guess as Koppel's philosophy is still as a correspondent at CBS and minds I try to have on the show is why stop those wheels from turning? Let them run uninterrupted uh, as long as they wish to. And you're quite right. He never... The one time I saw emotion come very close to the surface was he was interviewing um, the, the head of Austria who had been a member of the SS, Kurt Waldheim. Yes. And Koppel was a refugee. Koppel had left, I think, the Netherlands, then went to London. Uh, and the way he talked to Waldheim, he, he ne he, his voice got lower and lower and lower. And when Waldheim tried to evade, he said, oh, I think you know exactly what I'm trying to ask you, Mr. President. And you could see he was under control, but he was determined not to let this guy off the hook for his Nazi past. Uh, he was, but as I say, you know, both he and the executive producer, a shout out to Tom Batag, they cared not just about, okay, you know, the show made a lot of money, it was successful, what are we doing? There was one, I remember this in, the, in this era of, of uh, racial consciousness. We, it was a videotape editor, uh, a black man who said once at these meetings, you know, we do a terrible job on race. We don't cover it at all. And Koppel then made sure that a, a, a series of shows covered all these different issues about matters racial. So he would listen. You know, he would... He would not get defensive about that. He said, no, we can't do that. We know what we're doing. We have a successful show. Right. Uh, he was, yeah, he was a pleasure to work with and a great sense of humor. We still call each other to tell each other uh, jokes. That's none of nice. which, None of which I will come close to repeating here. That's fine. Uh, uh, Jeff Greenfield's our guest here at the Mike the Dream Podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with him. You know, I, we were talking about it off the air, and I did ask for those of you that watched my interview with Bob Costas, I did uh, ask Mr. Costas mm, about it. Yeah. September 10th, 2001, the iconic Rayo's restaurant in New York City. Yeah. It's a rainy late summer night. You're yeah. there with Costas and uh, Robert Wool, the creator of the show Arliss. Right. I'll let you take it from there. Well, Rayo's, for those of you who don't know, is, is, is the most impossible restaurant to get into in the world. Uh, I don't care if you are, if your Pope Francis is here, he ain't getting in. Uh, he rents the tables out on a monthly basis and somehow Costas had a table. He called me up and what I, it was one of those nights where the conversation was completely hilariously unimportant. Wall and uh, Costas get into a big argument about what's the standard for the hall of fame. Is it on a curve based on who's the best of the year or is there some objectives? And this was like, you know, one of those arguments it didn't get violent, but it was, you know. And then I think we went to some book party. It was, it was just the most relaxed evening. And then we woke up the next morning. It was September 11th. And it's always stayed with me. I don't know how much Casas remembers of it as the kind of lesson about life. You know, uh, the Grateful Dead have a line, when life seems like easy street, there is danger at your door. Uh you know, think of what we saw yesterday, you know, Kennedy and his wife coming into this glorious sunshine of Dallas, cheering crowds. It's a lesson that um, if you want to hear God laugh, tell her your plan. Yes. That's very, you know, it's folk wisdom, but boy, there's a lot to that. Yeah. 
no, it's 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 true. And and he he remembered it and he told me, you know, and, and Angela Ang wants to know, are you a deadhead? Uh, yeah, sort of. I as with as with most of my life, I discover these groups later than anybody else, <laughs> with the singular exception of the band, which is my favorite group ever. Uh, I had the I actually interviewed Garcia for a piece that never aired, and the day he died, I called Coppola. I said, "We got to do this show." There, and Ted is just older enough than I am not to care at all about rock and roll, mm -hmm. uh, and so we had to have Senator Pat Leahy on, who is a deadhead. A senator from Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I came to like him. I never followed them. You know, I, I am not a fan of the ten-minute drum solos or the feedback, but who they are and what they represented is is kind of endearing to me. Yeah. So you are Bill Walton. <laughs> in other in, words, Bill. Yeah. In many ways, that's true. In many yeah. ways, I am not Bill Walton. I eat meat. There you go. Um, you know, and yeah, I, I, he told me that story uh, going back to Costas and, and you and, and Wallet uh, Rayos. And that the next day, the biggest story up until 8.46 a.m. Eastern Standard Time was Michael Jordan's coming back. And he was at the Today Show studios, which I got the chance to see recently in a visit to the city, um, talking about that with Katie Couric. And then he left. And then an hour later is when everything, as uh, my friend Angela can attest to, her being a first responder to that event, uh, changed and, and not for the better. You know, what's interesting in, in about your career. CBS 79 to 83, like I said, ABC 83 to 97, and then CNN 98 to 07, back to CBS. It's one thing to leave a place after a short stint there. But in these instances, most of them at least, especially with ABC, you are there for a long time, you know, and then to change and go somewhere else. I'm curious, what's your metric or what was your barometer for saying, OK, I've had my fun here. Let me go. Because when you get to a place for a while in a business in which continuity is rare, most people stick with that. Uh, with the single exception of leaving CNN, which had to do with a not an entirely uh, comfortable yeah. arrangement with a senior, yeah. uh, just felt. But in the case of ABC it was and CNN, it was a, it was a different kind of challenge. You know, I mean, in, I could cheerfully have stayed at ABC. But I thought there was a different thing to try at CNN when, as an all-news program, as a network, there might be chances to try to do more stuff. And, and to some extent there was, and to some extent there wasn't. Um, I tried a show of my own. It lasted a very brief period of time. And I blame, of course, everybody but me. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, look, you know, as I told you, I think, right, I knew as a child that I wanted to do this for a living. Uh, and since Major League Baseball and Rock and Roll Guitar were, were not in my future because of the vicious prejudice against untalented people, uh, I found students something that I enjoyed. You know what they say, if you like what you're doing, it's not a job. And uh, for a long, now, you know, you can bitch and moan about all the logistics, but there's something to that. Uh, you know, if you, I mean, I we used to give a lot of commencement speeches, and Instead of telling people to live their dreams, because as I pointed out, many dreams are illegal, um, I would just say to people, don't do this job because it's some on some imaginary chart, it's more significant than what you really like. Hmm. If I had gotten a Supreme Court clerkship at a law school, I would have taken it, and it would have been a really bad mistake as opposed to having the chance to work for Robert Kennedy. So the, you know, if you're gonna get a job because of the prestige, or your parents want you to be a doctor, that's not a good reason. Herewith ended the sermon. Uh, I do want to hit on, 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 like I said, a few more things before we um, split split ways. It's been a great conversation with you. I'm glad that you. No, I'm excited to see whether the battery lasts for as long as you know. Uh, whether I, whether we're getting there, we're we're on the edge. This is a very tense moment. But go ahead, keep the you questions. Know, you were you were the author of 14 books and it's interesting because i asked this to a lot of authors our friend mike lupica mike has written so many books that at this point i imagine it's like clockwork for him but nonetheless there is a process there and sure the more you do it the more comfortable you get kind of like this show being 100 plus shows into it now but at the same time there is a process like i said that you have to respect and depending on whatever the theme is the book, as simple as that, just has to be a good read. It has to be an easy read. It doesn't have to be hard to digest. 
when you're putting this these books together, especially now that you have so many of them underneath your belt, what is the process, a good process at least for an author from your vantage point? Well, I'm the worst person in the world to ask because I have no discipline. You know, uh, I haven't written a book in several years. Uh, my first novel took 15 years to to gestate. Uh, I was years late on a project for my publisher, and the only one they threatened to sue for the advance of the creative juices suddenly, oh, I have an idea. But I will say that when you are cooking, you know, when you are, when, when, the, when it happens, uh, I remember doing a couple of books where I felt like, you know, I'd get to the computer every day and I felt like Stevie Wonder, you know, just, <laughs> just keep going, baby. But here's a tip for aspiring writers. You know, when they say the, the characters write themselves, no, they don't. No, they don't. Um, I think there are uh, plenty of authors, and Mike may be one of them, who can tell you that there's a process and a systematic. For me, it's like desperation. Uh, I'm at the edge of a cliff. If I don't write right away, I fall off the cliff, then I start writing. It's terrible advice. Uh, nobody should work the way I do. Writer's block. Yeah. yeah. I've been there. I, you know, when I'm putting together columns, you know, I, I write for myself. I've never written a book, but I'll write uh, columns. You know, sometimes the key is to get a body of work in there, at least. But sometimes even that is the hard part. So, uh, like I said, you know, I, you're a busy guy, so I, I, I try not to keep my guests generally too long. But I will I, tell you this. Read a book by Anne Lamott called Bird by Bird. It's the best guide to writing I know. It's what got me through my novel. She's a great yeah. writer on many subjects, spiritual. But this book, Bird by Bird, I have no financial interest in it. This will help. So... There you go. I'll, I'll look into it as soon as we uh, um, as soon as okay. we part ways following the conversation. It does sound like a good read, so I'll try to find it for sure. I'm sure it's easy to find. Yeah. So this segment that I do, since we're uh, past the hour mark, is uh, rapid fire. It's five oh, hit run questions for me, five answers for you. Are you ready? Well, sure. Well, we'll keep a baseball theme to start. All so right. this is a two part question. One, who do you think the Yankees come away with in free agency? And two, how long do you think the perceived blackout, if it happens, will last? Uh, I don't, based on the track record so far, I don't know, I don't know who they're going to get in free agency. It's not my turf. I think if there's a lockout, it will be a long and grim one. Mm -hmm. Second, greatest advice anybody ever gave you? I thought uh, a maintenance worker at the University of Wisconsin, watching a very high level argument about something, said, you know what? We're all stupid, just about different things. <laughs> not bad. Not bad advice. Uh, okay, so third, besides Rayo's favorite restaurant in New York City. Well, I have a, a lunch group that's been meeting on and off for now close to 40 years. And uh, we go to Michael's because the guy who makes the reservations goes to Michael's. Mm -hmm. um, but my favorite place is Barney Greengrass, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Jewish restaurant on the Upper West Side, uh, run by the grandson of Barney. Been there for 75 years. If you're looking for Nova, Nova Scotia sturgeon eggs and onions and, and a toasted bialy. That's where you go. You're making me hungry. Uh, fourth, you've been to a lot of legendary games at the old ballpark and the new ballpark, but focusing on the old Yankee Stadium, which used to get very loud. Mm. Loudest you ever heard the old stadium? 1956 Memorial Day, fourth inning, two on. Mickey Mantle hits a home run that bounces 18 inches short of being the first and only ball to clear the stadium. Mm. And the, the crowd in right field, when they saw the ball go over their heads, made a sound louder than anything I heard with one exception, and that was when the bell rang for the Ali Fraser first fight, which I was at. Oh, my God, wow. You have to throw that in there as a flex. Wow. Ali Fraser won. So fifth and finally, knowing what you know now, if you can go back in time and give advice to a younger version of yourself, what would you tell a young Jeff Greenfield? This ain't no dress rehearsal. Simple. Simple. Bob, Dylan, Bob Dylan's song, Forever Young, was a nice sentiment. It is not accurate. Hmm. There you go. Uh, well, that concludes this episode of the Mike Dunavian Podcast. Again, I want to thank everybody that tuned in on YouTube and LinkedIn. I'm introducing more live shows into the mix because I want to interact with you, the audience, more. And, and I want the guests to be able to do the same. Jeff, before we go, and we'll say our goodbyes off the air, um, is there anything that you'd like to promote? Any shout-outs you'd like to give? No. And I have to say... Uh, since I don't, and I have no vested interest, this was a very impressive interview, Mike. You did your oh. homework, and, and the questions were sharp and to the point. So stick with this. 
Uh, thank you very much. That means a lot coming from you. Uh, on my end, of course, as always, folks, if you want to find me on social media, I'll link that. If you want to contact me at my business lines and emails, I'll link that as well. So we have two shows coming up next week before I go on hiatus, and they're both uh, centered on the NYPD Bomb Squad. Volumes 16 and 17 of Tales from the Boom Room, Profiles of the NYPD's Bomb Squad. Richie Teamsma, who was a Bomb Squad detective and before that an emergency service cop, will join me. He had a hand in helping uh, quite literally and figuratively defuse a pipe bomb plot in Sunset Park, Brooklyn um, in 1997, which would have been the nation's first suicide bombing. So thank goodness he was there for that. And his partner, Paul Yerkoop, will join me Thursday to discuss his career and also that 97 job, but also getting shot and nearly killed in the line of duty in 1989. These two men did heroic work for their 20 years career. 20 year careers, I should say, and they'll both join me next week for volume 16 and 17 of Tales from the Boom Room Profiles of the NYPD's Bomb Squad. In the meantime, on behalf of Jeff Greenfield, I am Mike Cologne. We will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Stay safe.